Hey everyone, welcome back to the Science of the Bible. I'm super excited to be starting to dive into actual conceptual scientific things about climate change. Now, before we dive into uh, the ozone layer, um, the Green New Deal, all that stuff, we need to look at some fundamental things of why climate change is based on models and why people think that is going to be so bad. And that is because that is rooted in the old earth theory. So for climate change to be valid, we must accept that the earth has changed over time, meaning that it used to be one way and now it's a different way. So we must accept that. This means that we must accept an old earth theory. Now, why? You might be asking, why do we have to accept the old earth theory? Well, it's because models are based on ancient times from the past and those climate patterns repeating themselves. So what this means is that we've all heard of the ice age. The older theory states that there should be another ice age at some point. Now, obviously we haven't had another one, but that is what old earth theory is suggesting is that the temperature and the climate fluctuates up and down through time. So before we really get into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, to, and before we get into uh, renewable energy, non-renewable energy, we need to look at the old earth versus young earth theory. So old earth, according to National Geographic, the earth is about 4.5 billion years old, give or take 50 million years. So this gives us about a 1% error in calculations. So meaning it could be 50 million years older, 15 million years younger. Um, so there's millions of years that we can play with there on the 4.5 billion years old. Now that's according to the old earth. Now the young earth, uh, if we are taking the Bible as absolute truth and fact, which it is, we believe in its timeline uh, that Earth is around 6,000 years old. So they both have a six in them, but instead of 4.6 billion, we're thinking around 6,000. There's some debate if it's like six to 10,000, somewhere around there. But the bottom line is it's not even tens of thousands years old. It's thousands of years old and not billions of years old. So it's a huge difference. Uh, less than 1% of the time that science says Earth has been around. So science says 4.5 or 4.6 billion years. The Bible says 6,000. That's less than 1% of the time. So we take the Bible's absolute truth and we can go through the Bible and by using ages of people, we can know how long the Earth has been around. So we can start with Adam and Eve, uh, we can start with creation actually in the beginning in Genesis where God created the heavens and the earth and it took seven days. Now, there is a lot of theories out there and there's one company in particular who I won't say their name. Uh, you can go find their stuff on the internet. I would highly recommend if you want to see um, kind of what the what secular Christians are looking at. So worldly Christians are trying to adapt the Bible to fit their science because they are refused to kind of believe the power that God has. Now, if we take the Bible in all of its real, in all of its authority and believe that God created heaven and earth in six days, he created all of our earth in six days, then we can follow this timeline of the Bible. Now, there are Christians out there even that, you, that you'll run into that say the creation story actually happened over billions of years and didn't happen those six days. And what I say is that is taking away from how miraculous, how powerful, how wonderful God is to say that he couldn't have done this in six days and made it perfect. It had to be over billions of years and it just wrote out six days. Uh, that's taking away from how miraculous God is. And it's kind of shortening him. It's saying that he's not powerful enough to create the entire world in six days. So that is why we are not going with that timeline. We are going with the timeline that is told to us in the Bible. That creation took six days and God rested on the seventh. And if we go from that, we know that there's about 2,000 years from creation to the flood. And then there's about 4,000 years since the flood. Um, like I said, about that many years. That's not exact numbers, but that's where we get the number 6,000 from. So using that biblical timeline, we come around with a young earth, very, very young compared to what science is telling us. 
Now that's all good, but how can we prove it other than just the Bible? Because science has all these methods and ways to prove that Earth really is this old. So we're going to look at that a little bit today. Now before we get into that, um, what we're going to look at too is old Earth sets up a time when humans were not on the planet. So with old Earth, we must accept that humans are the main cause for a warming Earth. And to do that, we have to assume that there is a time without us. We also have to assume that we knew what the Earth would be like right now without us here, which is impossible. We cannot know what the Earth would be like without human interaction because humans have are here. We are here. We are interacting. So we don't know what the weather patterns would be like without us here. We can speculate that they've changed because we put carbon dioxide out. We can speculate all these things. We can run the numbers. We can put it into simulations, but bottom line is we cannot prove that this wouldn't be happening without us here. Uh, we cannot prove that uh, according to evolution, right? You know, if we're going to go down that rabbit hole, which we will talk about that later, we can't say that something else wouldn't have done this too. We can't say that there wouldn't have been carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere another way. We cannot say that matter of factly. Uh, so, one problem is that we have to accept that we are the main cause of a warming earth and we can't know that for sure because we do live here so we can't say what it would be like without it. Another problem is that we actually are in a fairly cold time of earth's existence. So there are some models that we can look at. Um, one of these models that I grabbed is the estimated global temperature over the last 500 million years. Now in this uh, model we have 500 million years ago the average global temperature was a little bit over 95 degrees fahrenheit so there were no polar ice caps so we're talking about the melting ice caps we're talking about all this stuff um or sorry there were small polar ice caps but they weren't like they are now so we're talking about all these ice caps we're talking about all this that it's going to be doomsday the end of time as we know it well, the problem with this is that according to old Earth 500 million years ago, we were at an average of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we're looking at trying to keep our climate from changing, we're trying to keep it cool. According to old Earth, it is going to go there anyways. So we're freaking out over nothing according to their own data as a figure. Um, if what they're saying is true, we should be start. We should start to climb up here soon we should start to grow in temperature. The temperature should start to rise. It's not something that should come as a shock to them, uh, which is where then you get kind of that head scratching moment of, if you say in the past, the average temperatures have reached up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit and they fluctuated, why is it such a shock to you now that it's rising again? Well, you know, deductive reasoning kind of thinking should tell you, well, it should go, it should go higher again because we are on a trend and that is what science is telling us. So 500 million years ago, 95 degrees Fahrenheit average. Then we go to about 450 million years ago and the average temperature plummets down to around 55 degrees Fahrenheit on an average. So this is if you take the average temperatures of all the Earth, uh, it was about 55 degrees. This is where we see um, the polar ice caps are here. We have ice up north. We have ice down south. We have those polar regions. And then when less than 50 million years, so by 400 million years, we're back up to about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're back now up to where the polar ice claps are almost no, are like non-existent or very, very small if they were there, but odds are they aren't there at all. Within 50 million years, we bump back up there. Well, this is when they say before humans even existed. According to science, humans weren't even on the earth 400 million years ago. So what caused that dramatic increase in less than 50 million years? If we weren't here, what caused it then? And why would it not be reasonable to say that it should happen again now? So we rise up there. Then around 350 million years ago, we have about 100 million years where for a consistent time we are a world with polar ice caps. So we are beneath 
around 65 degrees Fahrenheit for around 100 million years. In there, we drop back down into like 55 degrees Fahrenheit and we drop. But for about 100 million years, we're fairly cool. We're actually around the climate that we are right now. Uh, in today's world, we're a little bit warmer, but we are fluctuating around where we are right now. Then we go to 250 million years ago. This is where we were looking at like equatorial Pangaea, according to science. We're having, we're having too hot for even peat swamps. So peat moss is not growing because it's too hot for it. 250 million years ago, we jumped back up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit on a world average. So we're jumping way again. We're jumping huge up again. And once again, humans do not exist at this time, according to these numbers. According to the model and the timeline we're going from, we're looking over right now, humans do not exist. So these jumps are happening without humans, according to the science. According to uh, climate change research, these jumps are happening without humans. Uh, we go another 50 million years forward to 200 million years ago, or we'll even go, we'll go to 175 million years ago. 175 million years ago, we dropped back down to around a 65 degree average for Earth. So again, the whole Earth, if you take the average temperature around 65 degrees, we have polar ice caps again. Then we come up to the Cretaceous period about 100 million years ago. Once again, back up to an average of 90 degrees Fahrenheit for the Earth. Uh, jumped up there without humans once again. Miraculously, that happens over time, according to science, according to their own models. Like we've seen one, two, three times now, the temperature has jumped without humans there. Uh, it stays above the polar ice cap. So it, there's a line around 67 degrees Fahrenheit on average where polar ice caps are present beneath that 67 degrees average, not present above it. So for about... 125 million years, the world is so hot that the polar ice caps aren't existent again. Or if they are, because, you know, we weren't there, we can't know 100%. No one should ever tell you 100% in science because we weren't there. Uh, but according to data that we know, there shouldn't have been polar ice caps. And if they were, it was just ice floating around there. But most likely, they were non-existent. So up until 50 million years ago, up until 50 million years ago, there were no polar ice caps on Earth. So for that 125 million years ago, there were no polar ice caps according to science. Then 50 million years ago, we started to cool down again enough for the ice caps to form. Now, we follow this trajectory downwards. We follow this trajectory downwards, and then we get to today, where the average temperature is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Still have polar ice caps. Uh, humans have not sent us into getting rid of the polar ice caps now. We're still beneath that line. We are going back up, but something that they want to scare you with is they have this line that looks like we're going up so fast that it's unsustainable. Well, if you look at this chart, um, the chart I'm looking at right now, the chart I'm talking to you about and explaining to you, you go back and look at those last jumps and they look the same. They might be a little bit wider. So you have this coming down, it's decreasing, and then you get this jump. Ours might look like this compared to this but it is still increasing in the past too. So this chart that I grabbed was from the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, if you look up estimated global temperature over the last 500 million years, if you look up that chart, so estimated global temperature over the last 500 million years, if you type in that chart, you should be able to find the same chart that I just explained to you. And you can see those rises and dips throughout the 500 million years, as they say. The problem with this is that does not support what they're saying of we are the ones causing the temperature rises. So the issue that we have here is that if science is to be accurate in this sense that we are the ones causing the temperature rises, we should have never seen those rises in the past the way that we did. Because humans, according to this theory, were not there. According to old earth, humans were not there until this current rise is happening. Now, this is something that's kind of like confirmation bias. We're looking for something and we get it. We are looking for a change and we see it. However, we are ignoring all that other data that we have. This, the science is ignoring all the data from the past that they put out. They're saying, yeah, it was here before. 
Um, but we're not going to look at that because right now humans are here and we're increasing the temperature. Well, that's happened over time according to them. That has happened throughout the ages according to their charts. So they're contradicting themselves. Either we are causing it, and if we are the causes, it should not have risen in the past, or we are not the causes, and the data that they give us actually supports that we aren't the cause of the global warming because the globe has warmed in the past using their own figures. So we're gonna move on from that chart. And again, this is giving us a baseline of looking at kind of the past, looking at things that we are ready to talk about, carbon dioxide and those things. So that was the old earth on global changes and how science says that it repeats itself and it's a cycle and we are still in that cycle. Um, even though apparently we are screwing up that cycle that is still going in the cycle. So that's the old earth. Now a young earth, the issue that we have with that chart that we just looked at is it goes 500 million years in the past. And what that means is that it goes beyond when humans were alive. So according to science, a lot of that chart 95% of the chart we just looked at, actually more like 99% of the chart we just looked at, was before human life even started. So an issue that we have with that is that according to the Bible, according to what we know as fact, humans have always been on Earth. Humans have always been here. And climate change only works with the exception that there is a time before us, and we just looked at how that it doesn't even work that well. But climate change... Saying that humans are the, chain, are the cause for climate change has to mean that there was a time before human interaction with the earth, which we know biblically is not true. There was a day or two, but not thousands of years. Humans have been on the earth as long as the earth has been here. Now, science says otherwise. Uh, we have evolution and all that stuff, which, I, like I said earlier, we'll get into. But a young earth means that we have been here the entire time. We have been on the earth since its creation and we have been interacting with it more than anything else. Now, the funny thing really is that if people really want to cry climate change, they should believe in a young earth um, because in the beginning, we didn't have automobiles, factories, and those types of things. So those are exceptions to what would have happened thousands of years ago. We didn't have those types of things. Now we do. So if climate change really were true, the fact that people believe in this old earth theory, but then say that you're stupid if you believe in a young earth, well, the young earth is the only one that would actually give us real data to see like if carbon if um if our automobiles were making it worse because we don't have that data saying that it's happened over time already. The past data of the old earth that they say supports climate change actually bites them in the foot. It shoots them in the foot because it proves that the climate changes without us. If we wanted to say that we were the cause of climate change, we would have to say that we were always here and could study that. Now, climate change also works under the assumption that God gave us the ability to destroy the world which he has created for us. So Becca always says this, and she always says um, whenever climate change comes up, she's like, I just don't think that God would let us destroy the world. Like he wouldn't create something that we could then be able to destroy. And in Ecclesiastes, it actually has, I love Ecclesiastes for science because it gives us the hint to that none of what we are doing is new. In one way or another, it's there. The carbon we're putting out into the atmosphere has always been there. It will always be there. The carbon dioxide is part of that carbon. It cycles through. We know this in science. It's called the carbon cycle. We know the conservation of matter means that no matter can be destroyed or created. How much matter is here is what will always be here. So we're putting that just back and cycling it. Now they're saying we're doing that too fast, but it's always been there and it always will be. And we know this from Ecclesiastes 1.9, which says what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which you one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. Now, I don't know about you, but that also kind of matches up with their graphs that they're doing where it cycles through. Um, very biblical that things cycle. So they also take that idea from the Bible. They don't know it, but their idea that climate change is cycling 
is a biblical idea, and we find that in Ecclesiastes 1.9. Uh, the water cycle that it cycles through, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, everything in science is a cycle, and Ecclesiastes tells us um, that everything that has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun, so it all cycles. So it's not really a shock for us as Christians to know that the earth cycles itself. God created it that way. God created these cycles to sustain our lives, which we need. We wouldn't be able to live without the cycles. So that's kind of um, using some of their data to show why, how they try to support climate change and why their data actually bites them in the foot. And then the young earth, why we look at the Bible at how climate change only works under the assumption that God gave us the ability to destroy the world and that we have not been here. So we're going to look at some old earth stuff again. And I told you we we're going to look at how we decided the earth was 4.6 billion years old, how we decide how old some things are. So we get the age of the earth through a few different types of dating. One is called relative dating. This is age in comparison to others. So this is like if you go to the Grand Canyon, you will see strata or layers of rock or strata if you want to call it strata. And this is where they go like this. You can see, if you look at a picture of the Grand Canyon, you can see the layers of rock on top of one each other. So there's a layer here, then a layer here, and they go on. Now, what this has done is there's called a principle of superposition. What this means is that this rock layer is younger than this rock, is older than this rock layer. This rock layer is older than this rock layer. This rock layer is, young, is older than this rock layer. So as the layers build, they get younger. The oldest layers are at the bottom. Now, something called cross-cutting, so when an earthquake or something happens, there's a line that can go through the layers, and that is the youngest. So sometimes you'll see a line through layers, and we can determine ages of rock and what events happen first based on that. Now, unfortunately, neither of these processes can give an age for scientists. They can just give us the principle of faunal succession. What this is, is there's different fossil species always appear and disappear in the same order. So Tyrannosaurus here, chicken here, all the time. Never different, never chicken here, Tyrannosaurus here. That's what the principle of faunal succession says. Now that's an oversimplification, but you know what I mean. They have to go in order. They have, one is always here and the other's always here. They never flip. Now, what it says is that once that fossil species goes extinct, it never, it disappears and cannot reappear in younger rocks. So what that means is if the Tyrannosaurus is here and there's a layer of rocks here, once the Tyrannosaurus is extinct, it can't appear up here is what they say. So it only can be down here, it can't be up here. And we found that to be true. We found like these layers of rocks to be true. Now a problem with this is that they say these layers took millions of years to happen and to build up because they have their deposits of rock, their deposits of limestone, of calcium, of sand. Now, they say that this happened as the water receded and came in and receded. There used to be a lot of the earth underwater. The old earth theory says that this takes billions of years to happen. The young earth theory, which is a few thousand years, gives us a way that this layering could have been accomplished without thousands, millions, and billions of years. And we don't need to look past Genesis even for this answer. There is a natural disaster that happened in Genesis that could have caused this layering a lot quicker than billions, millions, and even thousands of years, and that would be the Great Flood. And that would also cause mass extinction events, because there's only two of each kind put onto the ark. We'll talk about that more in evolution stuff too. Uh, but there's only two of each kind left on the ark, brought onto the ark. So when you think about that, there is actually a lot of animals that did not make it. There was a lot of animals, while their kind was saved, they, pers they were not because there was only two of their kind. So there should be a lot of layers where there's a lot of dead things. And that does make sense. And it does add up where there are a lot of layers where there's a lot of fossil record and then there's not as much. So it actually adds up with a natural disaster. Now, a lot of times they like to think of the natural disaster as an asteroid or something like that, a put carbon dioxide, but there are a lot of other religions that talk about a great flood as well. So the great flood is actually a, a very good answer to why these layers built up 
how they could have built up so fast, and why there are such rich fossil specimens in some of them. And it also gave a perfect way for fossils to form because it covered them quickly. So through relative dating, the Great Flood, Noah's Ark, that story could lead to the relative dating being skewed in science and an inability to accept that that could be a possibility is an error on the side of science that they refuse to look at what could have been an answer and say, no, it can't be that young because we have this other type of dating. This other type of dating is called numerical or absolute dating. So this provides a chronological estimate of age of layers. So what that means is that it tells us how old those layers are. So those layers that we got in relative dating, numerical dating tells us how old this bottom layer is, how old the second bottom layer is, how old the top layer is. It tells us the age of those using the fossils in there. It takes them and it looks at isotopes in there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is called radiometric. They use radiometric dating to do that, which uses radioactive decay and potassium and carbon are commonly used. So you've heard of carbon dating, I'm sure. We're gonna look at how they use that and what could possibly be some iffy things on there. Some other methods that we won't go into depth to on this video because they'll require a very strong basis in chemistry, a very strong background. I just want you to know is electron spin re resonance and thermoluminescence. Essentially, these are things that require some sophisticated equipment um, I would have to probably do another hour long video to explain it in enough detail. So we're just going to say, we're going to look at radioactive decay. That is the main one that you're probably going to talk about. Uh, if anyone tries to argue this about you, they're going to bring up carbon dating, most likely, or potassium dating. So we're going to talk about those two to prepare you all. So if we take a little closer look at radioactive decay, we need to know something first. We need to know that in every atom, there are protons, neutrons, and electrons. These are the things that make up an atom. Now, isotopes of atoms exist. What an isotope is, is for example, I have carbon. We're just gonna stick with carbon. In carbon's base structure, it has six protons. Anytime I have six protons, I have a carbon. It is impossible for anything to have six protons and not be a carbon because carbon has six protons. If I, have seven car if I have seven protons, I do not have carbon, I have nitrogen. So I, you need to know that carbon never has any different than six protons. So if we are looking at this, there are different levels of isotopes. So an isotope would be carbon has six protons and six neutrons. It's even there, it has six and six. Now neutrons don't have a charge, but we can add or take away neutrons. So I can add an extra neutron to carbon and make it seven neutrons and six protons. This would be carbon 13. So carbon 13 and carbon 12, so carbon 12 is six protons, six neutrons. Carbon 13 is six protons, seven neutrons. Those two atoms are very stable. Carbon-13 and carbon-12 are stable atoms. Now, I could throw an eighth, pro an eighth neutron in there, and I would get carbon-14, which is very unstable isotope. It's radioactive. Now, carbon-14 is radioactive, and it decays into nitrogen. So what they do in, radi in uh, radioactive decay and in radiometric dating, so what they do is they take the amount of a parent isotope, which is the carbon-14 in this case, and the amount of daughter isotopes, or nitrogen, because remember, carbon-14 decays into nitrogen. They take the amount of carbon-14 and the amount of nitrogen, and they determine the age of the sample. Now, they can do this because the rate of decay for many radioactive isotopes has been measured and does not change over time. We're going to talk about that in a bit. So, for example, a half-life. A half-life is how long it takes one gram of carbon-14 to decompose into half a gram of carbon-14. So it's how long it takes for carbon-14 to be cut in half. So if the measured abundance of carbon-14 and nitrogen-14 in a bone are equal, so one half, one half, then the bone is 5,730 years old. 
So 5,730 years is the half-life of carbon. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of have an issue with 5,730 years old. The issue is nobody has been alive or around long enough to say with absolute certainty that it, that is the half-life. Now, we've done tests. We have done tests. We have facts. We have figures. We have data that gives us very relative, like very close to accurate things that we can trust. However, I'm sorry, but no one has been allowed for 5,700 years to make sure that that's exactly how long it does. But well, yet we use it as fact to say that this is the age of this rock or this fossil, this um, bone, this wood, this charcoal, this shell. This has to be used on organic materials because that's what has carbon. But I can, I understand, um, they, and I want you all to understand, they do have processes where they can get really close and they can say with so much certainty. But the bottom line is nobody has seen carbon-14 decay over 5,730 years. We can say we have, we can say we've run the numbers, we can say we've crunched it, but nobody has seen that happen. And that is calculations that we have come up with. Who knows if those are wrong? Science is always changing. Science is always learning and evolving and adapting. Who knows if that 5730 is wrong? If it came out to in a year, in a few years, that the half-life of carbon was actually only 100 years, that would drastically, drastically, drastically change the age of the Earth. If it came out to be only a thousand years old, it would drastically change. And the fact of the matter is, it's 2021, 200 years ago, we didn't have the technology to accurately test this. So we can't even know for a fact if a sample of carbon-14 would decay over 200 years. The only way we can know is to put a sample of carbon-14 in a sealed container and to see if after 5,730 years, it's half carbon and half nitrogen. That is the only way we can do this for certain. Um, now, of course, like I said, you're going to get it run into, well, we know the numbers, we know the figures. Well, what if those are wrong? And it's our job to question that. What if that is wrong? What if that isn't correct? Um, and that's, if someone says that you aren't allowed to do that, they aren't really trusting science because you are allowed to question science. Uh, anyone who says that you can't question science is wrong. Do not listen to them. You are absolutely allowed to question science. That is the only way that science moves forward is through questioning and through uh inquisiting. Um, if you never question anything, science never advances. So questions are fine in science. Questioning if science is accurate should happen every day. So my question is, how do we know that's accurate? How do we know? Because we don't have any physical proof. We don't have any tent. We don't have any proof that we can see, touch, feel here. And that is why I believe in the young earth, because our dating methods just we don't know if they're accurate to thousands of years, but we use radiocarbon dating. So I put this little chart under my younger section to show kind of those ages. Um, radiocarbon dating, the age range of applications, one to 70,000 years. So they say we can measure to 70,000 years. Uh, potassium argon dating. So potassium uh, bearing minerals and glasses thousands to billions of years so they can go from thousands all the way to billions of years um again don't know how because we can't measure if something has decayed for a billion years uranium lead ten thousand to billions of years uranium thousand to five hundred thousand fission track thousand to billions now I'm sorry, but if we're measuring things in thousands of years, I kind of want more certainty than we ran the numbers, we did the check. Uh, I know a book that tells me otherwise. I know a book that tells me that's not right. And I have logical sense making that tells me maybe something is a little off there. Uh, because most of the stuff that they use shoots itself in the foot. We will, um, like I said, this is just, I'm preparing you to have conversations to open doors, not conversations to go into a full-blown breakdown of climate change, but conversation to open doors with unbelievers, climate change to open doors with those, conversations to open doors with those who might be on the fence, conversations that you can kind of see, well, here's how God could be working in that. Here's maybe how that isn't completely right. 
Here's maybe how that is shooting itself in the foot. Maybe we should look at it from a different perspective. So it's to give you ways to start conversations with people instead of saying, no, God said this and you're wrong. Talk with them about maybe why their argument's wrong. Say, well, let's look at that. We know this, we know this. Be like, but I have something that supports what I'm showing. And then you can bring the word into it. It gives a doorway to strategically give people the word. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to open that door. Um, I have had some thoughts about maybe doing a little bit deeper dive even. Um, not on a YouTube series. It would be something a little bit different. But for now, I want to open doors, give you knowledge to get started, knowledge to start conversations, knowledge for you to maybe have places to look. So I'm super excited for next week when we're going to go over the next topic, which I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe it is, oh yes. Next week we are going to start carbon dioxide greenhouse gases. So we'll be looking at the climate, the carbon numbers over time. We'll be looking at that stuff and we will be preparing you to have those conversations with people who are so rooted in science that they don't even give faith the chance. So I had a lot of fun. Uh, this is definitely one of the longer videos, but it's because there's so much into it. Uh, we could have made this a three hour video in all honesty. I try, I'm trying to do my best to break it down into simple things that can be jam packed in about half an hour, 45 minutes. But like I said, these topics are so full and rich and so dense that we could have talked for three hours, probably even longer. We could have talked for three days about this topic and still scratched the surface. So really jam packed, really quick. We're going to go over climate. We're going to go over greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide next week. And I really look forward to it. All right, everyone have a blessed week and I will talk to you later.